Take your Bibles and turn with me tonight to Second or First Thessalonians chapter two. First Thessalonians chapter two. If you would please stand for the reading of God's word, if you're able to this evening. First Thessalonians chapter two. We begin reading verse one. It says, "For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance into unto you that it was not in vain, but even after that we had suffered before." And were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of our God with much contention. For our exhortation was uh, not of deceit, nor uncleanness, nor unguile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts." For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as, nurses, as a nurse cherisheth her, child, her children. So being affectionately desirous of, of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye, ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses in God also, how holy and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which is in Judea, or in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their prophets, and have persecuted us. And they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always. For the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavor the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Back in verse 1. We're going to go through this chapter, we read all of it, and look at some things here. But I want you to notice here, he says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, otherwise coming to you with the gospel and trying to encourage you, that it was not in vain. That it was not in vain. I'd like to preach a message I've titled, It is Never in Vain. Let's pray. Father, we come to you asking that you meet with us now. Bless, Lord, the preaching of thy word. We'll give you the honor and glory. Help us to realize the importance of getting the word of God out. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. Paul in chapter 1, he commends the Thessalonians concerning sounding out the Word of God and how great a testimony of telling others about the gospel that they had with great joy, that they, they were witnessing, they were telling others about Jesus Christ. He commends them for that. Then here in chapter 2, Paul begins to lay out how that he and the others came to them with the gospel even after they had suffered much contention while they preached the gospel at Philippi. If you look there in verse 2, it says, But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi. That's why he says, We were bold in our, our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. He said, Even though there was a lot of contention, even though there's a lot of problems, even though that we had been, had been abused at Philippi and we went through the difficulties and struggles, he said, We didn't quit. No. So we kept on going. We kept on pushing forward. We kept on preaching the gospel. We kept on getting the word of God out. 
You know, it's amazing today, it don't take a whole lot to stop a lot of Christians. It don't take a whole lot to get Christians to quit witnessing. It don't take a whole lot to get them to, to lay down the Bible and then walk away. So Paul shares with them the reason that they kept going and telling others and, and didn't quit when things got tough or people rejected them and they rejected the gospel. And so he's dealing with this here in chapter 2. Uh, Paul, first of all, said it's not in vain. Look again, verse 1 says, Yourselves, brethren, know our entrance coming unto them and unto you that it was not in vain. You know, there's a lot of things that's in vain. Like me telling those kids to sit down on the bus. <laughs> uh, it's just like one of those things, like it blows my mind. I had, had one today that uh, I'd, got, I'd told him to sit down like three or four times. Next thing I know, kids, I, stop, I make a stop, and, and, and the first thing you do, you look up in the mirror, and there, you know, you got three that's supposed to get off, and you got 27 that stand up. <laughs> and uh, you tell them, just sit down, sit down. And so they all sit down, and the next thing you know, this boy, he pops out, and he's standing in the middle of the aisle doing some little dance. I don't know what it was, but he's doing a dance. And then next, next time I stopped, he popped up again, doing a little dance out there. Finally, I told him, I said, buddy, I said, you're going to see the principal tomorrow. <laughs> And, uh, but uh, he said, no. I said, yes. And it seems like in vain sometimes, some things in our lives. But you know what? A lot of times people begin to look at what's taking place in our world and say, what's the use of telling people about Jesus Christ? It don't seem like they're listening. It don't seem like they're accepting it. It doesn't seem like anybody cares about it when sometimes Christians, they get discouraged when, they, when they're rejected or the gospel's rejected. It may have been that you've been talking to somebody for weeks, months, maybe a few years or something about trying to get them to come to church or trying to tell them about Jesus Christ and, and they just basically they don't want anything to do with it. And you keep trying, but then they, they push back on it. And finally, you, sometimes you get to a place where you say, there's no use. And you get discouraged. But Paul's telling us here, it's not, it's not in vain. Many times Christians want to quit telling others about Jesus Christ. They want to quit inviting people to church. They want to Quit taking a stand. They want just to live right and do right as far as living for the Lord and doing in that standpoint. And just live to themselves. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to serve God. I'm going to do what's right in my life. I'm not going to, but I'm not going to bother anybody. I'm, I'm, I'm done with it. I'm just I'm going to obey God. Well, you can't obey God if you don't go and tell others. Yeah. He's going to go out on the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. He told us that we're to give the gospel out. And so many times the thinking that, uh, that we're just obeying God and just doing right, my friend, that's part of it is taking the gospel to others. They feel like they just aren't doing any good. But Paul said here, it was not in vain. It's not in vain. You may have a child that's wayward. You might have a family member that's wayward. You might have friends that are lost, that are wayward. You may have, you may have, uh, and it may even, maybe they're saved, but they're out of church, made their way from God. And sometimes we get to a place where we almost throw up our hands and quit. I've told the story, I'm not going to go through the story. But my, my uncle, we had for years, for years, for years, had tried to get the gospel to him, given through gospel tracts, talking to him some. Everything, and he had always rejected that until he was 89 years old and got saved. You know what? I'm just going to be a harmless and honest with you. There was a thought in my mind, what's the use? He's not going to get saved at this age. But what if we had quit? What if we'd said, you know, doesn't matter. He's not going to get saved anyway. What if we hadn't went back again? Very possibly he would have died without Jesus Christ. We see in chapter one the difference that it did and ma that it made in the in the in the those uh, in the church of Thessalonica and how that from there they spread the gospel even unto Macedonia and and uh, into Achaia. You find that in chapter one. And you see how that they did that. We find over in First Corinthians chapter fifteen verse fifteen it says, "Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, unmovable." Always abounding in the work of the Lord, 
not quitting on God, not stopping, not, uh, not laying down the, 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 the challenge, not laying down the, 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 the armor, not laying down the sword. But he says, uh, always abounding in the work, Lord, for as much as you know, he says that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's not in vain. And many times we think, well, what's the use? Sometimes we get to a point where we think, what's the use of praying anymore that it don't seem like it's working? And we quit praying. Can I tell you something? Don't quit praying. We, we preached on that the other night. Pray without ceasing, the Bible says. And that means unless God tells you no, keep on praying for them. And, and unless God tells you no, keep on witnessing to them. Unless God tells you no, uh, keep on inviting them to church. Well, preacher, I just feel horrible about that. I just feel terrible about it. I'm always inviting them. I'm always trying to get, give them a gospel track. I'm always trying to, to get them to, 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 to receive Christ as Savior. I get to a point where I, I, I'm embarrassed almost. But the, but the Lord didn't say no. Keep on. Because it's not in vain. Yeah. It's not in vain. We don't know... We do not know what's going on in their heart and life. We do not know how that the Holy Spirit is working within them. Therefore, we are to be busy doing what the Lord has told us to do, and that is to be a light, to be salt, to be the one that takes the gospel to people to tell and to shred and to shed, shed light upon their lives, to sow the seed. We're to keep on and keep on. It's not in vain. We're, instructed with the, we're entrusted with the, uh, the gospel here. Look at verse 4. He says, but as we were, we were allowed of God. Let me stop there a minute. You know what Paul's saying? He didn't say that we just grabbed it up. He said, we were allowed. That means that it, not everybody can do it. He said, but we were allowed. He said, well, preacher, then maybe we're not allowed. No, we're all allowed. If you're saved, you're allowed. He said, we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. With the gospel. You should never take lightly when somebody entrusts you with something that is, uh, is of great value and that cannot be replaced or has been purchased at a very high price. What if I entrusted you? With a, with a million dollar object. I don't know what it would be, but a million dollar object and I entrusted you with it, would you take it seriously? I would hope that you would. If I entrusted you with my child while I was gone somewhere, I would hope that you would take it seriously and, and protect that child and watch over that child and do what's right for that child. If I entrusted you with my truck, and, and even though it's of less value, I would hope that you would do your best to, to take care of that vehicle and, and return it to me uh, in the same shape that I gave it to you. Well, actually cleaner than what I gave it to you. <laughs> but God has entrusted us with something. Listen to me. Gold will be gone. Any item that you will buy for a million dollars here on earth will be gone one day. Amen. It'll burn up. It's going to burn up. Everything's going to burn up one day. Okay? God's not going to destroy this, this world with a flood anymore. He's going to destroy it with fire. It's all going to be gone one day. But he has entrusted us with something that is so valuable. You say, well, preacher, how can you say that the, that the, that the gospel is so valuable? Because it's going to make a difference for eternity. Forever. Absolutely forever. Amen. Paul's expressing that here that it wasn't something to take lightly. It is God himself that has instructed every born again believer with the gospel to take the gospel. If you're saved tonight, I can go down this line here and I can say, if you know Christ your Savior, he's entrusted you with the gospel. He's entrusted you with the gospel. He's entrusted you with the gospel. If you're saved tonight, he's entrusted you with the gospel. He's entrusted you with the gospel. I can go all across this auditorium. If you're saved tonight, he has entrusted you with something that will last for eternity. Amen. It's not cheap. He said, well, preach what? It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that others might be saved. How? Well, okay, but 
how great a value is. It's like this. Let's say that I led Levi to the Lord. The Lord entrusted me with the gospel, and I, and I give him the gospel. Let's say he gets saved. How valuable is it? Well, you just did that. Guess what? I'm going to see him in heaven one of these days. I'm going to see him in heaven. But it's not just if I led him to the Lord. But let's say that I invited him to church. And let's say that, that uh, Brother Jeff led him to the Lord. Guess what? I got a piece of that. And one day, uh, I, he said, you remember me? I said, I have no idea who you are. <laughs> he said, you invited me to church. He said, Brother Jeff Mosley led me to the Lord. I got saved. I'm here in heaven. Uh, so it's something that's going to last for eternity. Let's take it another step. Let's say, do this. He's Chinese. He's in China. And I'm not being racist when I do that. Don't throw a fit. He's Chinese. He's in, in China. I, I can't go to China. I'm not in China. But Brother Jonathan surrenders to the Lord to go to China to preach the gospel. And so I give in the missions offering, maybe every week or every month or whatever, to help support sending Jonathan to China because, because Lila wants to get rid of him. But anyway, to send him to China so that he can preach the gospel. So he preaches the gospel. And guess what? Uh, 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 Ching Chang Chung uh, uh, Li I got saved. Okay. Guess what? I have a part in that. Yeah. And it's of great value because it's going to last for eternity. Many times we don't stop and realize it's not in vain. It's not in vain to give to missions. It's not in vain to, to tell somebody. It's not in vain to invite somebody because we don't know what's going to happen down the road. Excuse me. We don't know what's going to take place. We've been entrusted with the gospel. Do you really realize what you have been entrusted with tonight? Well, you know, we tell you. But do you realize what you have? If you're a born-again Christian, God has entrusted you with the gospel. Preacher, I know you quote those verses out of Romans, the Romans road. You can quote them and everything. Yeah, I've done it for years, and that's why I can quote them. But I can't quote them, and I can't explain them. No, but you can tell somebody what you did and to get saved and what Jesus Christ has done in your life and what he's doing in your life, and you can share what Jesus Christ wants to do in their life and how that he can save their soul. Amen. Can I say this? And I think you ought to get some scripture. But you wouldn't have to have, 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 you wouldn't have to quote a verse out of the Bible to tell somebody about Jesus Christ and what he's done in your life, would you? Right. Yeah. Now, I think it's good because there's power in the word. And his word does not return void. And most of us know John 3.16. You know John 3.16. You got enough to win the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And you can spring off of that and tell what Jesus did in your heart and life and how you put your faith and trust in him. And my friend, we have, we've been entrusted with something that is precious. Let's say that I, let's say that I, uh, I, I, I'll use Blake over here. Let's say, let's say I, one day I walk up to Blake. I said, Blake, I'm going to give you this bar of gold. I'm entrusting it to you. I want you to do something with it. Now, he can do one of two things. He's, going, he's become the steward of it, okay? A steward is a person that takes care of something for somebody else. He can go out and dig a hole and bury it. Or he can use it and invest it and reap something off of it. When God saved you, he made an investment in you. And we are to reap. And we are to reach out. 
and do something with, our, with that life, that eternal life that he's given us. We're not supposed to just bury it in a hole. He's entrusted it to us to, to win others, to tell others about Christ. Paul goes on to say that he won't, cha he won't change to please men or withhold it to please men. Verse 4 there, it says even in the latter part of the verse, it says, Even so, we speak not pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. He said, I'm not going to change the gospel. Here's our problem today in the world. The world wants to change the gospel. You put your name on a church roll, you're going to heaven. No, you're not. You be a good person and you're going to go to heaven. No, you're not. You go get baptized and you're going to go to heaven. No, you're not. We're not to change the gospel. The gospel is the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we must confess uh, that we're sinners and we must receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and put our faith and trust in Him. Not what we can do. And Paul said, I've been entrusted with something that I am not going to change. I'm not going to change any of it. I'm going to do what the Lord wants me to do with it. I'm going to tell others about it. And I'm going to stay the same. You see, we should desire to please the Lord and not man. This world doesn't want you to talk about hell, talk about the lake of fire, talk about the penalties of sin. They want you to pat them on the back and tell them everything's going to be all right. A lot of times in that minute in his word that not only goes on social media, but it goes on the radio station. I just plain out tell people, without Jesus Christ, you're going you're gonna to wind up in a lake of fire for eternity. <laughs> in fact, I just recorded some more for two weeks and just sent them to the radio station. And I know there's some in there that talks about winding up in a lake of fire. You know why? Because we're supposed to tell the world what Jesus Christ wants us to tell them. Now, along with that, I tell them what Jesus Christ can do in their hearts and lives if, if they will trust Him, that He died on the cross for them and rose again so they can have eternal life. You see, it's usually our pride or our fear of man that keeps us from giving the gospel. We're afraid what they might say. We're afraid we might lose their friendship. We're afraid that they might slam a door in our face. We're afraid that they might cuss us out. We're afraid that they won't want to be our friend anymore. We're afraid that we might lose our job. And we're afraid. My friend Paul says, I'm not afraid. Paul was beaten. He was thrown in jail. He was left for dead. And we go on to all the things because Paul was trying to get the gospel out. How soon we forget that the Lord is ever present and watching how we handle that which he has entrusted in our with us. You know, sometimes we think if somebody gives us something and entrusted in our lives that they don't know what's going on. In many cases that's the way it is, but God is different. When he entrusted the gospel to you and I as Christians, he's watching. He's paying close attention. Verse 5 says, For neither at any time use we flattering words, as ye know, nor, nor a cloak of covetousness. And notice what he says, God is witness. Why is God a witness of how we're handling the gospel? Because you and I one day will give an account of what we did with the gospel after we were saved. What we did with it whether we shared that. God knows what we do with the gospel. He knows those times when we do not tell somebody. I'm going to be a harm and honest. There's been times that the Holy Spirit of God has tugged at my heart to talk to somebody about salvation, and I didn't. I'm being honest. And I think if you'd be honest, there's probably been times in your life that the same. Guess what? I may have to give an account for that one day. I have many times thought, boy, I hope those folks got saved that I didn't talk to. If I never saw them again. It might be in a parking lot. It might be pumping gas. It might be someplace. And I had the opportunity to give them a gospel track. Maybe not a chance to, 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 to share a vocal witness with them. Because such a short period of time. But God laid on my heart maybe to give them a gospel track. 
And I didn't do it. I remember times, and I've told about times, I've given uh, tracks out in, in, in hospital elevators and stuff like that. And there's a few times I'd be, I, you know, I talk, it's good, to, it's easy to talk about the time. Yeah, I gave him a gospel track in the elevator and everything. But I'm going to tell you what, there's been times when I've been in the elevator and God said, give him a gospel track. And I didn't. God watches what we do with the gospel. I'm just being honest. The fact is, is that we should take every opportunity that God gives us to be that witness for Him. He's entrusted that with us. Paul gave more than just the gospel, though. Look with me in verse 7. But we were gent gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the, not the gospel of God only... Well, hang on, he's getting ready to say, well, what else? But also our own souls. You, because you were dear to us. So what are you talking about, preacher? They were willing to lay down their lives to give them the gospel. They were willing to make friends with them. They were willing to spend time with them. They were willing to lay aside some things in their own life so that they could befriend them. Can I tell you something? Right? Listen to me. In many instances, you can't win somebody to Christ until you win them to yourself. Amen. Now, I'm not saying that you don't witness to people who you don't know and, and everything. No, you witness to anybody and everybody you get an opportunity. But I'm going to tell you something. The majority of the people that you will win to Christ and the majority of the people that you will get to come to church and the majority of the people that you can help is the people that you befriend. Do you know why it's so important that we become a friendly church and be a friendly church? It's so that we can get them to come back so that they feel comfortable, feel at home, the walls come down, and they listen. That's why we have handshakes. We don't just do that out of habit. Just so, oh, now you may. And you'll find, and, you can, and most of you could testify this. I come in, I go around and shake hands at the beginning of the service. I try to reach everybody before the service. And then at, during, the, during the handshake, and I come back around, and a lot of people say, oh, second time or whatever. And I laugh, and I'm, yeah, shake the second time. You know why I do that? Because I feel that it's important to get to everybody. We've got to win people many times to us before we can win them to Christ. We've got to befriend them. That's why instead of standing in a pew, let me encourage you to get out and shake hands. Oh, but preacher, that's just not me. Well, think about what God's entrusted to you. Let me, can I meddle here for a minute? Let me meddle just for a second. This is home folks tonight. You should know pretty well everybody by first name. Or learn over a period of time. Why? Because you're going to be, if they're saved, you're going to be in heaven together. Wouldn't it be something to get to heaven and go, ah, ah, ah. know the face, but don't know where I've seen it at, but well, I'll sit by you every week at church. <laughs> And I understand sometimes it's hard to remember names, okay? That's why, how you doing, brother? <laughs> how you doing? Sister. <laughs> Amen. Now, don't mix them up, all right, okay? <laughs> we got enough problems with that now. And I'm just meddling right now. I need to get back to my notes, right? I know. 
<laughs> but it's important. You, no, preacher, you need to preach the word and get, yes, you're right. But befriending people is important. Yeah. Being friendly. And I, with that said, let me, let me brag on you. Everybody I talk to, they talk about how friendly you are. Shaking hands. And, and laugh and have a good time. I'll brag on you, okay? But I want you to know how important it is. How often as Christians forget that we're dealing with precious souls. People that Jesus laid down his, his life for. Because he loved them. We need to truly love people because that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did. You know, when we shake hands, we really ought to be because we love them. Care about them. Sometimes we're dealing with rude and crude and hard people. But we've got to remember that they'll spend eternity somewhere. Don't get your hackles up if they're rude and crude. Just keep getting the gospel to them. The psalmist said in Psalms 126, verse 5, 6, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seeds, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing sheaves with him. Having a heart broken over lost souls, wanting to see people saved. Hey, listen, the reason that the Lord has allowed you and me to even be here is that we might be a light, that we might reach souls for Christ. Otherwise, he might as well just take us home. That is the need. In Jude, we find in verse 22 and 23, it says, And if some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. The old saying is, most people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Right. And there's a lot of truth in that statement. Our daily lives will speak louder than our words will. Look at verse 10. Ye are witnesses. God also how holy and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. You know what he's talking about? Our daily life. He said we were unblameable. You couldn't say, yeah, you're one way on Sunday, but a different way on Monday. He said we were unblameable. You've seen that and God's seen it. That we were the same each day and we lived for Christ and lifted him up and magnified him. Folks, can I tell you something? Every day we ought to be living for Jesus Christ. The lost world and Christians and the Lord are daily watching your life. Now, there's always going to be hindrances. Look at verse 18. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but notice what but Satan hindered us. Can I tell you something? If you're trying to live for the Lord Jesus Christ, Satan's going to try to hinder you. If you're trying to tell people about Jesus Christ, Satan's going to try to hinder you. If you're trying to be a witness and a testimony to your family, Satan's going to hinder you and you're going to have uh, uh, some of this family uh, going on in there because Satan tries to keep you from being that witness. If it's at work, you're going to have some conflict maybe trying to be that witness at work and, and Satan's going to try to get you stirred up and try to make you look bad before the people. There's going to be some things where Satan is going to try to hinder you. He's going to try to stir up your flesh. He's going to try to stir up your anger. He's going to try to stir you up and get you all bent out of shape. Can I tell you something? That's one of the things that, and I say this quite often, but I think it's so important. It just flags all over me when Christians cuss. You know why? The lost world knows Christians shouldn't be talking like that. The lost world knows how Christians ought to live. And so we should live a life, as Paul said here, unblameable. Don't give Satan any help. Live for the Lord Jesus Christ. There's always going to be those hindrances. There's going to be the hindrances, things, or people to, to sidetrack you or to make it difficult to live for, for and witness for Christ. But we must press on for the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then close them. There's a crown waiting one day. Does anybody in here like getting paid? <laughs> Don't lie. You like getting paid? Yeah, we all like getting paid. I mean, hey, uh, 
There's something that, that way, and God wants us to be that way. God wants to reward us. God wants to reward us. Look at verse 19. He says, For what is our hope, our joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? For ye are our glory and joy. We talked about it a little bit here, but as we live in witness of the wonderful Savior, souls will be saved, lives will be changed, and, and, and enriched. Christians will be uh, uh, helped. There will be a crown awaiting for us in heaven one day. If we will be that witness and, and, and get the gospel to people. You say, well, what if I didn't win... If I didn't lead them specifically to the Lord, preacher, but, but say I got them to come to church and they got saved, guess what? You get that crown of rejoicing also. Yeah. Well, what if, uh, what if I just gave them a gospel track and they got saved? You get that crown of rejoicing. It's a, God's going to reward us for living for Him and being a witness for Him no matter how we do it so that we can get some things accomplished. But even greater, there will be those who... We had a part in seeing, as I said earlier, seeing them get saved in heaven. We need to tell others about Christ. We'll see that reward by telling others. We'll see that reward by supporting missions. Sometimes we don't realize the importance of supporting missions. But you know what you're doing? You're you're, you've got an opportunity to reach around the world, not just here locally, but around the world. Inviting, praying, having a prayer life, praying for souls, passing out tracts, helping with children's churches, or working on the bus, cleaning the buildings, and uh, working in the nursery, uh, uh, singing, uh, 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 doing all kinds. We, we, there's, there's no end to it. Oh, I'm pretty sure I just get so tired of, of doing this or doing that. I get so tired of working on the bus. I get so tired of cleaning. I get so tired of, of teaching. I get so tired of this and everything. But Paul said, it's not in vain. I don't get any pats on the back. Nobody uh, has me stand up and, and, and blows the trumpet and calls my name. Hey! Maybe not here, but one day in heaven. It's not in vain. It's not in vain. So press on. Have a heart in living for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it is never, never, ever in vain. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We love you. Help us, Lord, maybe even tonight find a place and pray and determine in our hearts to live for you, to be that witness, to get the gospel out, to invite to be involved in the work of the ministry, finding things to ways to be involved, finding ways to help get the ministry going, finding ways to, to reach others. It's all important. It comes together. Lord, we thank you for that. Sometimes some of the things that go on that people don't see, the mowing of the grass, the, the taking care of the flowers, the cleaning of the the buildings, the, the making of the, the prophet's chambers, the, all, it all is important and it's not in vain. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to witness for you. Have your will and way, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with your head?